today we had a presentation of um, the interim proposals for a new public space in uh, Albert Embankment. And there we actually discussed this idea of um, myth and um, monument and the relevance to uh, public spaces. And it appears by what you're saying is that actually they're, they're, they're crucial to having that personal connection but also having that, that, um, that larger and more um, national and um, communal connection as well. well. I think it depends how your mind works. I mean, because it's almost a joke, Trafalgar Square, full of these inscriptions saying how proud and grateful we are and nobody knowing who they are. They all, I suppose everybody knows who Nelson is. But I did have an Australian friend who said, why is Trafalgar Square called Trafalgar? What's the big deal about Trafalgar? And uh, it was fair enough, you know. Why, sh why should she know about the Battle of Trafalgar and Nelson and losing his arm and Kiss Me Hardy and England Expects? Why should she know all that stuff? But the monument is there to um, make sure you don't forget it, basically, because it's there. But um, it depends how your mind works. If you see Havelock and says, never be forgotten, and you start thinking, yeah, but who was he? And you look him up and you find out, of course, your life is enriched by this experience. And the Soviet War Memorial in Treptow Park was a... Uh, I'd never heard of it. No one's ever talked to me about it, even though it's... You know, even though I was saying it was one of the most sublime pieces of landscape work in Europe kind of thing, this is how I was feeling about it at the time, but nobody had ever said anything to me about it. And, uh, you know, going from there to read about the Battle of Berlin and how it was constructed and how they squeezed and squeezed in the middle, Hitler killed himself and squeezed, squeezed, laying the whole place to rubble and then building it, you know, it, it adds up into a... Well, it's a piece of narrative history. A narrative, a narrative is a picture of the whole world. It's what writers do. They make narratives. And you can't include everything in the world, so you pick various things out to write. You pick some of the things out and write about them, and you string them together. And that's called a narrative. And that's why a narrative has the quality it has, because it, it isn't about everything, but the attempt is to describe everything. And I think... Uh, if you've got a narrative tone of mind, these monuments, in me anyway, they do trigger these lines of investigation. I guess, I guess, just from my perspective, you're, you mentioned the word flaneur and and being a flaneur in the city and immersed in the city. So, a flaneur, does the monument and the public, the loaded public space, does that not quite contradict that? Because a flaneur would wouldn't would fight would reveal the hidden. And whilst whilst what you're saying is actually these. These monumental spaces, they they also can be can be they're important for somebody just wandering through the city and changing their perception of the city. In other words, I guess are they needed for to, to be a flaneur? Would you uh, avoid monumental spaces? Or well, you tell me. I've never read it. I never read Benjamin, so I don't know what a flaneur is. I thought a flaneur was somebody who. took his own trajectory through the city without recourse to the official line. Is that right? That's, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's my understanding that, as that's well. That's more of a derive, maybe. That's more what psychogeography is about, yeah. situation and stuff. But um, um, what is, you may be right about the, the deliberate avoidance of these places, but what do you do when you stumble across them? Mm. You know, you have to take them into account. And if you... Yeah, I can't, I can't figure out. I, I, took, I didn't know about Treptow Park, so I took it at face value, and I found it wonderful. And it gradually got more wonderful when I realised what was going on, where the bones were, and what's, how it bore the name of Stalin, and this all added to the thing. What am I saying? I suppose the world is replete with meaning everywhere you look. That's why the academic, academic world is so pissed off with Wikipedia, isn't it? Because you say something to a student and they got it right there. But the internet will one day crash and burn in flames like everything else. Yeah.
what's your relationship to like technology in the city and how do you how do you think that's changing public space? Sorry, my relationship to technology. <coughs> did you hear me? Yes, I did actually. <laughs> But thank goodness you got a microphone. Because um. a lot of what you've said um, seems maybe a little bit old-fashioned. I think it's very enjoyable, but... Um. Well, excuse me for being old-fashioned. <laughs> I honestly don't know what to say to that. I think... I or think how, do you, how do you relate to it? What you're do absolutely you right. Apart from Google Maps and Google Earth. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. I think what I'm trying to work on something where we start with the story of William Blake railing against the academy. And, uh, you know, the Royal Academy was founded by Joshua Reynolds to, do, to raise, to become a center of excellence in painting and was about technique and theory. And William Blake poor soul, hated it because he was interested in spirit, not in, in um, education. And he saw education as being really quite a difficult proposition because it was telling people what to think when in fact they should listen to the spirits in the air and that would be what to think. And he died in poverty and ridicule and Reynolds became more and more famous and the Academy has gradually taken over the world until there is an official line on knowledge. If you, write an, if you write a book and it doesn't have footnotes, it can't be accepted by the academy because you're, the purpose of a footnote is to corroborate what you say and fit it into the, the, world, the systematic world of knowledge that the academy represents. This doesn't sound like an answer to your question, but I think it is. Now, if you work in an academy and you suggest something to a student, the student bypasses all that and goes straight to the internet. And this is very frustrating for teachers who are, have become used to rigor and first principles and uh, teaching the body of knowledge because the knowledge has gone out of control. And at first you think Blake would have appreciated that, but then you realize that the... the um, the thing which isn't a body of knowledge is, is, is more like a, a jungle, uh, which is just um, growing and growing and growing, and nobody knows what's in there. Nobody knows what's growing in there. And I've been speculating about the possibility of the internet being like nature and concluding that it isn't like nature because it's not evolving in the same way. It's changing, but it's not evolving in the same way. And the thing about nature is that it's occupying a, a kind of temporary ledge on Earth. We started with this... I'm talking about the biomass I've got, uh, in terms of nature. It's operating a temporary time, chunk of time on Earth, which started four billion years ago and will end in five billion years when the sun explodes. So nature... nature Nature is more profound than the internet because it has somewhere to go without humans. But it's going to end in the end because it's going to come crashing up against galactic finitude, at which point Blake suddenly reappears in the story, saying, yeah, that's what I was talking about all along. That's my current relationship to technology anyway. <laughs> I've got a friend who's seriously ill. She can't get around very much. And also she lives in the middle of nowhere. And she spends her entire time on five different chat rooms specific to her personal illnesses. And is having a really great time on these chat rooms. She said she's made more friends there than ever before in her life. She has a complete virtual social life, which is real to her. And I think that's quite interesting. But that's not really... I don't know what your question is about. Because I can remember, you know, 10 years ago, long time ago now, 
you know, when you were still at school, maybe, and people were starting to say, how's, 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 how are computers going to change public space? And I used to think at the time, then they're, they're not, because space is space, you know, it's like, it's made out of rocks and trees and grass and air, and it's, it's, it's hard. And of course, the, the perception of the space will change, but the space itself won't change. Yes, I think that's... Everybody that's, that, knows that, right? Well, I think you're right. The space doesn't change, but the use of it changes, or the way people use it, the way, the way people engage with it. Well, I've noticed people aren't talking to each other on the trains anymore, but then they hardly ever used to. They're talking to the rest of the world. I'm a bit dismayed by this question, to tell you the truth. It's a good one. About five years ago, I was giving a lecture, and somebody said, how do you think Twitter is going to change the landscape? And I snorted with derision, because I didn't know what Twitter was. This is five years ago, right? And now Twitter itself is disappearing over the edge of the horizon. And it does seem that technological changes are very, very rapid. Actually, I've written a book about it. It's called Artificial Love. I suddenly remember I've written a book about technology <laughs> called Artificial Love, which goes into the, the predicament of automation quite a bit. It's a book about machines. What exactly does old fashioned mean? <laughs> Looking like Prince Albert. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> Thinking things that aren't thought anymore. That's, that's surely another lecture. <laughs> well, this is a talk. <laughs> I just wanted to get you to talk, really, because you kind of embody what you're. you're <laughs> be, please be careful what you say. <laughs> I just mean that the way you narrate your lectures is quite different to the way that I would read them. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to get you to talk I'm sorry to go on about this. I do find it quite disturbing, though. I, I, you know, when you teach all your life, you gradually <laughs> find your students. Are, when you start, I started teaching when I was about 25, so students were my generation, and then they became sort of the age of my children, and then they became sort of the age of my grandchildren. And it's a weird thing to do, because there are certain advantages to accumulating experience, you know. And uh, even though a lot of it is um, uh, difficult to sustain, that's the word, even though a lot of it just simply won't survive. And um, I've, got, I've got some friends who I guess are in their 30s now, friends of my sons who are architecture critics. Do you know Douglas Murphy? I'm talking about him. They're politicians, all of them. They're, they're Occupy freaks. They're, uh, what's that French version of Occupy called? And they are um, uh, interested in the utopian movement after the Second World War of rebuilding. You know, they're interested in brutalism and they're interested in that. And it's as though they want, they want the thing to be clear. They want clear instruction about how to make a, a new architecture of the kind that was offered after the war. This is what we do. We're going to build it fast, and some of it's going to be no good, but it's going to be there, and this is how we do it. Stack people up, deck access, you know. That we have techniques for doing it. And it struck me that Douglas and his friends really want to hear that in architectural theory. And here I am, uh, you know, wandering through the, what was it? Wandering through the gardens of knowledge wandering through the gardens of perception. I could work on that line and come up with something 
And I'm just wondering, I have been worried about the relevance of it. I was wondering when you decided to change private public space into personal public space as the title of your lecture. Uh, yeah. were, were there any reasons or why there would were, you say? Actually. Yeah, there, were, there was a reason. Uh, well, there was a kind of feeling rather than a reason. It was personal private space because of this difficult thing I was trying to transmit about the Treptow Park Soviet War Memorial and going there and discovering that the, the place was set up for me to feel in a certain way proud of the Russian army specifically grateful to Stalin for ridding the world of fascism and that wasn't the feeling I had at all I, I felt that it was beautiful and it was like being in the Villa d'Este or on top of the Acropolis and it was full of the depth of meaning but it wasn't what had been intended me to feel, and so I thought, okay, personal, public space. And then politics did start to enter my brain, and I'm just wondering now whether it entered my brain because of what I was just saying, that obviously students don't want to hear this. They want to hear something clear and politically relevant which is when I started thinking about the private public space because there's a, there's a whole slew of stuff about privatised public space, you know, all about unofficial police forces in shopping malls and all that sort of stuff and, and the um, unspoken rules that pertain in the Amsterdam red light district on the street and all, all, all that interesting private public stuff which could be talked about, and I started looking at these London streets filling up with debt packages, and um, I thought that was the way the lecture was going to go. It's been quite hard to put together. And then I realised I wasn't going to do that, and that I was going to continue with the string of um, six great places in Europe, and so I switched back to being personal private space. I was just trying to ask a question um, that may maybe help you to say something more about the connection between the lecture today, uh, as in, it's about private, uh, personal. The, the key word would be personal to me. It's something personal. Uh, can you uh, would uh, would you be able to say something more about the connection between this keyword, personal, and to architecture. architecture? Yeah, something like that. To architecture. Yeah, yeah, or. Not as your writer, book. you can say something from your perspective, as in the, the sense related. It doesn't have to be. Yes, I don't know. I've made you answer the question again. I don't know where to start. Because <laughs> I, I mean, I think that's my my entire understanding of the value of architecture is that kind of relationship with the stones. But I think. It is a relationship with stones and rocks and trees. You know, my, I've got a very simple hunch about architecture being you take the material of the world, you reshape it and turn it into something else, turn it into something human. And that's what architecture is. This is why cars are architecture and why sculpture is architecture and why landscapes are architecture. It's the, the material of the natural world reshaped by humans to suit themselves. This is... This is it sounds like a very general definition, but I think it's quite specific, and it is, it is trying to, trying to purchase. It's trying to take the dead, in, inorganic dead things in the world. That's not right, is it? Isn't it? Isn't that they're dead? But the things that exist, like a rock that exists in nature, exists from second to second to second to second to second. It doesn't exist in time. It just exists in the present moment, is how I'm thinking about it. When you've taken that rock and you've carved it into something else and turned it into a, a piece of architecture, it suddenly has a lively duration like a, like a human life. You know, it has a duration like a life rather than the existence like a thing. And buildings are right poised on this interesting difference between a thing that exists and a thing that is lively. And uh, this is the, I just this is what the book I've been writing about 
that I've just finished is about. It's about an attempt to come to grips with this complex idea because, um, you know, it may be old-fashioned of me to say it, but I think, I think the task is not now to rebuild the shattered cities of Europe as it was in the 40s when the utopian architecture was invented and promulgated as, some, as a means of clarity. But I think that the material nature of the world is severely battered by the machines and the money and the media. And there is a, a task to be done for architects to try and reclaim architecture from that mess. I suppose that's related to what I think about technology too. I think, I think, um, I think it's like money. It generalizes things to the degree where they find it hard to exist. And, uh, yeah, buildings are interested because they're half alive. Well, I don't know if it's really a question. It's just... Like some places you spoke about are somehow more abstract or more abstract from a distance and then you can read some kind of more figurative in a way when you get closer and then I don't really know but like for example the how come some Is this a problem or a good thing? <laughs> no, no, I, I, I just find it interesting. Have you ever designed a building? If I have, yeah, because mm. it's one of the one of the most thrilling things about designing a building is that you hold the whole thing in your mind, in, in in your memory, and you keep having to flash between the general view of the thing and the detailed view of the thing. And if you make a change like this, you have to flash all the way through. Mm. I mean, you don't do it anymore because the computer does it for you. But in in the old-fashioned way of designing a building, with your memory. You, you make a change and then you have to flash right through your memory of the understanding of the thing to find out how the change affects everything else. And it's a, a thrilling enterprise. And I think uh, to that extent my architectural training does show in the writing because I'm consciously, I'm consciously looking at the world like this and then noticing a thing like that. Is that what you're talking about? But then <coughs> What? Yeah, they're, they're, when, once you get down to windscreen wiper level, they're disappointing, though, aren't they? Because the thing maintains, and then for some reason it suddenly goes into perspective. I've never understood why they did that, instead of just getting closer and closer until you can see the cat sitting on the wall. But then, for, for example, the, the prehistoric hill you showed at the beginning, somehow it's also very powerful, but f for me, I, it's, it's also abstract more abstract than, for example, the cathedral in Lincoln. And I, I don't really, I don't understand why it touch, the photo at least touches me now. Whereas I understand, I can understand why the cathedral can touch me, not, just because I can read it maybe more easily. Yeah, Sil Silbury Hill is pretty blunt, it's true. And the, those, those um, 12th, 13th century cathedrals are amazing, amazing pieces of work. And I think that's why they're still there. They've, they've always been recognized as amazing pieces of work. Nobody has dared get anywhere close to knocking them down because everybody feels the same way about them. But they're spectacular pieces of architecture in the, in the sense of sculptural sense. But I think if you have a problem with the abstract and the figurative, uh, it would be something to work on. <laughs> no. I don't know. I don't know whether. I don't know whether the figurative is the uh, is a a tiny version of something huge or what. I don't know how you would describe it. That's the difference between the two things. But it strikes me as being an old-fashioned distinction between figurative and abstract. Since this topic is current, how things go. Out. If you read art criticism, read art criticism from the 50s and 60s, when this was the subject. Are we figurative or are we abstract? Mm. And people were attempting to lay down certain rules about it. We don't look at this work because it's figurative. 
we only do this because it's abstract. This is the Clement Greenberg debate, and there were there were many artists trapped like mosquitoes in spiders' webs by this thing of knowing they were figurative artists and unable to do it and having to flirt with abstraction. And uh, it's an immensely interesting subject, but I think I think it's underneath it a phony subject. I don't think it really exists. And what you're noticing in Silbury Hill is a, a blunt gesture, whereas the cathedrals are fine, fine, careful gestures. But they, the depth of the architecture, I would have thought, was the same. Thank you. Maybe we can continue these discussions in the, in the bar. But Paul, thank you very much for a very okay, thought-provoking thanks. lecture.